Uh, in 2016, let me give you some statistics. 2016, there were 10.7 million arrests in the United States. 7.9 million property crimes resulting in losses of 15.6 billion USD. 95,730 rapes and 17,250 murders. And those are the murder figures from the FBI, so they don't include the over 1 million babies who are murdered in the womb every year. And we let those numbers think in. And today we have an epidemic on our hands. We have an epidemic of crime. We have an epidemic of sin. An epidemic of evil. An epidemic that's rooted in a hatred of God and a rebellion against Him. It's an epidemic that leads to death. To death. And so, with this as the backdrop, what we're going to do today is uh, discuss one of the functions of government in response to crime. And that is the death penalty. So how many of you have ever heard uh, a sermon preached on the death penalty? I was asking my wife this. You know, she's been going to church her whole life, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Have you ever heard a sermon preached on the death penalty? Nope, can't say that I have. So that, that was her response to me. That's, that's good. It's fun to be a little bit uh, different every now and then, right? But uh, I want to... Uh, when we talk about the death penalty, some of us may be on different sides of this, but what I want to do is I want to consider it biblically, see what the Bible has to say about this issue, and then I hope we can end the study with a unified view after we see what the Bible has to say about it. I was, uh, I was sitting there this, this week and uh, prepping my notes, and Eli looks over at me and he goes, Dad, what are you going to talk about this week? And I go... Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about capital punishment. He goes, oh, that sounds, that sounds like what I do when I do my vocabulary homework wrong. <laughs> my, my, my literature homework wrong. Uh, I thought that was funny. So then I explained to him what it was. But uh, what we're going to do is I think it's going to take about two weeks. Uh, I, want to, I want to go through the topic. I want, to, I want you to see... This is rooted in the fact that in, in the adult Sunday school class, we've been studying through Romans chapter 13. And in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it talks about being subject unto the higher powers, the government. And we were talking about the authority that God has put in place for governments on this earth. But I want you to not only see that authority, but I want you to see the principle behind it. Okay? So why don't you turn over to uh, Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And I want to ask you the question is, what is the cause of this epidemic of death in our culture and in our society? You know, the murder rate that we have is just simply too high. It's, it's, it's an epidemic. That's, but what's the cause of it? And as I was thinking about it this week, I thought that, uh, you know, when I was thinking about this, the, dip, the debate about the issue, and a lot of times one side says, well, we just need to educate the people. And if we educate the people, then the problem will go away. And, uh, you know, information is not the answer. Information is not the solution. Humanists, they do this with racism. They do it with international conflict, right? Like if we just talk to the terrorists, if we just get on the same page, information will win out and we can all just get along. They do this with health issues, Right? Like if we just provide the information, the public with information that smoking is bad, then people will stop smoking. Well, that doesn't work either, does it? I like, I know that it's wrong to eat fast food. And I know that it's wrong to consume a lot of sugar. And yet, I still eat a Big Mac. I, I have the information. I know that it's wrong. But inf the information doesn't change what I'm doing. So it's the same way with crime, that there's a group of people, there's one philosophy or one mindset that says, well, if we just educate people, then we would all be better and uh, we could all just... T to, to demonstrate that, the crime statistics that I just quoted you were from the FBI's website. And I found it interesting that at the bottom of the, the reference that I used, it makes this statement. It says, the more complete the data, the better we can inform, educate, and strengthen all of our communities. 
Education is not the key. You know, there's people who work in hospitals that know that smoking is wrong, and yet what do they do? They take a smoke break, and yet they're the ones treating the patients who are dealing with the consequences of smoking and the lung cancer and all of these things. So information does not make people better. Only the change that comes from being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ makes people better and changes them. So the issue is not an information issue. The information is a heart issue. I want to establish that point before we move forward. If you look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5, it says that, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, does that say that the thoughts of men, you know, were sometimes wicked? Does it, does it give the impression that, well, sometimes they're good, but then sometimes they break down? Oh, I'm a good Christian, but then sometimes I break down? No, what it says there is that the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And there's some background to that, when every man was doing right in his own eyes, right? So the only, the only standard he was living up to was his own conscience, and he said he was doing right what, what was right in his own eyes, but what did the heart of men what to, want to do? It was evil. And if you don't believe that that sentiment is correct, you could also look that up in Genesis 8.21, Jeremiah 3.17, 7.24, 11.8, 13.10, 16.12, 18.12, on and on you could go. The fact is that men's heart, uh, it's, it's, it's wicked, it's deceptive, right? Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. Look at verse number 3. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. So, you see that it's really the nature of man, right? It's not just, it's not just some of the circumstances we find ourselves in. It's full. It's full of evil, hatred, we're mad. It's a mad society, and you look around, you can kind of understand that, right? Men are just obeying what their heart says. When we tell little Johnny, oh, just, let, just listen to your heart, Johnny, you know, and then Johnny winds up being an evil man, and then we wonder why. Well, we've given him unwise advice because we didn't consult the counsel of the Word of God. But, so the, the, the verses definitely do not imply that it's a lack of information. They don't say that, well, men were just ignorant, and if they would just and if they would just learn this information, then their their hearts would not be evil. It, it didn't say it was a lack of information. That's not what it's implying. So there's this rebellion. There's this. Uh, I use the word right and left, or right and liberal. Uh, you know, for the philosophies that undergird our society. So there's this liberal rebellion that says the solution is education, right? But education is not the issue. That's what they fight for. Education, education, education. And you go into the, well, it may be a little, um, I, I, won't go, I won't go down that route, but you look at what they do uh, in the schools with certain types of education because they think if we just educate our children on how to act in these relations between man and woman, then everything would be better. And then what happens? It gets exponentially worse, right? So education is not the answer. Knowledge puffs up. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 8 tells us. That leads to pride. Thinking that the answer is just information is prideful. It's a lack of humility. That, or the, the answer is really in humility, right? Not, not a lack of information, which information puffs up, leads to pride. But if you humble yourself and realize what you are before God, humility is the answer. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The answer is in the base things. Not this education of and information of things, you know, great and far and wide. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. It says in verse 26, 
For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's the base things of the world that make a difference. It's the base things of the world that God has put in place that makes a change in people's hearts and mind. So there's another reason we know that, the, that, the, uh, uh, that information is not the issue. And that's because we know that all men have the required information that's needed. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They're holding the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. The things which may be known of God is manifest in them. It's been manifested before them. They've become face to face with it. And when people are confronted with their wickedness, what do they do? It hardens them even more, right? Pharaoh put himself, or God put himself before Pharaoh. Pharaoh was rejecting God. And God put himself more and more in front of Pharaoh's heart. And what, is it, what did it do? It hardened Pharaoh's heart against him. When you put the truth in front of a prideful person, what does it do? It hardens their resolve against the truth that you're sharing with them. It takes a humble heart to receive it. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They're clearly seen. Are they seen? Are they seen dimly? No. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, did they know him or did they not know him? Did they have the information or did they not have the information? They knew God. They had the information, but they chose to glorify him not. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. The issue is not an information issue. The issue is a heart issue. The issue is a heart issue. People talk about the questions of life, right? Like it's some big thing and they'll make documentaries of it, you know. Oh, the questions of life. Who are we? Where did we come from? How did we get here? As if they didn't know. Fools. For the fool has said in his heart that there is no God and fools love company. And they make themselves feel better about their foolishness by surrounding them with other fools. Right? Bill Clinton was an adulterer. Did people still approve of him? They liked him because his sin made them feel better about their sin. So people enjoy being around, people who are in rebellion against God, they enjoy being around people, other people who are in rebellion against God. They enjoy it, it makes them more comfortable. It continues to harden their resolve against God. Look at, look at uh, verse number 31 of Romans chapter 1. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Without understanding. The answer is not information, but rather an understanding that leads to faith in God. They had the information. They didn't act upon the information. They chose not to. So you could provide these people with all the information in the world and that would not change their hatred for God. The same is going on with the criminals out in the, this world. There's no rehabilitation by showing people information and telling them that murdering their neighbor is wrong. If you look at the liberal platform, they say that people are taught hatred, right? They say that's where they learn these things from, that, that racism is taught at an early age. You don't need to teach my child to do wrong. It's already in his heart, right? You don't need to teach people. They, already, they have it within themselves to do that. So it's not a learned behavior. Matthew chapter 15. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. So all the information in the world will not change their hatred for God. Would you agree with that principle? 
when you witness to people, is it an information issue? When you witness to people and you tell them the truth of God's word, does everybody submit to the truth? No, that's not an information issue. Come on, you know, this is, this is, this is simple stuff. And yet I have to cover this because when we get into the death penalty, I want to show you the, the objections to it and the responses to it in addition to the scriptural viewpoint. Matthew chapter number 15, verse 16. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Where does the evil of men come from? It comes from out of their hearts. It protrudes out of their mouth. It's in your thinking. Because you don't just have to commit the murder, right? You don't have to just commit the fornication, the adultery. But what does Jesus say? You think the thing in your mind. And it's already done. The way that a man's heart leads him to think, so he is. You know, what's the saying? You know, how you live your days is, is how you live your life. How you think is how you are. This says, you know, what entereth in at the mouth, go into the belly. What you eat is what you are. Well, I tell you what, what you think is what you are. Because that determines the, the, your, your heart, the thought, the mind process. All right, let's move on. So why were they without understanding? Because those, look at, look at uh, Hebrews chapter number 3. Because those evil hearts are acting in unbelief, right? This is the point I said. They're acting out that way out of rebellion against God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says, Hebrews 3, 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. There's a live, the evil heart comes from unbelief. And these people that Hebrews was talking to was living that. Now, I, I didn't tell you to hold your point there, but you know where the book of Romans is. Go back to Romans chapter 1 for one more reference. Romans chapter 1. So let's start to get into uh, this issue of the death penalty. Romans chapter 1, look at verse number 32. We talked about those people. Uh, look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteous fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, so on and so forth. Go down to verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God. Oh, they know that there's a judgment of God coming. Oh, they're not ignorant. They know the judgment is coming. They want to live their lives as if it's not. But they know that the judgment of God is coming, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You remember how I told you misery loves company? Well, there's a verse that supports it. I wasn't even planning on supporting it. forgot about that. There it is. Misery loves company. Rebellion loves company. They have pleasure in them that do the same. But notice that the things that they're doing is worthy of death. Worthy of death. So, I want to make one quick point if you come to Romans chapter 13. And if you've been in the adult Sunday school class, then you've, we've already covered this, this issue, that we're to be subject to the government. We're to be subject to the government and the divine ordinances of God. Look at Romans chapter 13 and verse number 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So just as God separated the husband and the wife into a unit and then separated parents with their kids into a family unit, he separates people into national entities where the bounds have been put in place. And if you don't believe me, then ask somebody else in Sunday school and they'll explain it to you. So while we're living in the dispensation of grace, we also live in a time of human government where God has delegated authority to man to rule. Now, nationalism that God has put in place, it's, it's a foundational and basis of protection externally and internally. Externally, it protects your house through military defense, right? Nations have an obligation for their natural defense. Um, internally, 
internally. It protects you through proper enforcement and in administration of laws. We are a society of laws. God has certain principles. He's delegated those principles to nations to uphold. So there's the issue of laws that are executed, administered, enforced, and evildoers are restrained. Let's keep reading here in chapter 13. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. They're resisting what God has put in place, the higher powers, the government. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God. Uh, he's a minister of God. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So I want you to see there that the government is a minister of God. He's doing what God has put in place. The ordinances of God and the government is doing that. Even when the governments are evil, they oftentimes do the right things by upholding laws, right? Because even when you have a wicked ruler, he still upholds the laws in his country, by and large. All right. So if you're going to violate the law, you're going to be uh, punished. Government is the administration in nationalism that God has established. And God has given uh, capital punishment, and for many reasons that we're going to get into. But just to, to point out, on a very basic level, there are three types of killings that are authorized in the Bible. One, the killing of an enemy in battle, right? Two people go to war. Are the people that are fighting in this battle, are they held responsible for the people that are killed on the other side? No, they're not. You're also justified in personal defense. And the third one that we're going to see is that it's the function of the state to execute a criminal. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse number 4 again. For he is the minister of God, the government is the minister of God, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Now, what do you use a sword for? Do you use a sword to, you know, enforce a traffic ticket where you say, you know, somebody, do you do that for retribution? No. What is a sword used for? It's used to execute. Execute. You know, if, if we were talking about something less than death, maybe we should talk, maybe, then God would have used a different word, like maybe a paddle, you know, like maybe a switch, like we use for our children. But he says, be afraid because... They beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, I want to point out something to you at this point. So now we're going to get into the death penalty. So I laid the foundation that the reason that we have the crime and the epidemic that we see is because it's a heart issue. And we know that the only answer for the heart issue is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So there is a sense where God can have mercy on us who are evil. We'll get to that later. But I want you to see that um, the death penalty is a transdispensational issue. And what I mean by that is when I say we're going to look at the death penalty from a biblical standpoint, I also want to look at it from a dispensational standpoint, right? We're a dispensational church. So I've got it divided up into a couple of columns here. And if you can't see it, because I had to make the chart a little bit smaller to fit everything in. If you can't see it, let me just give you an overview of it. What we're talking about here on the left is the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we have before the law was given and after the law was given. Before the law was given, we have two time periods, pre-flood and post-flood, after Noah gets off the boat. And then after that, when the law was given, we have the death penalty under the law, and then we're going to look at what, what does the Bible say about the death penalty in Christ's earthly ministry. Because surely when Christ came during his earthly ministry, he started teaching to forgive everyone, right? And that we shouldn't judge others. And I sure hope you don't agree with that because we spent about four weeks talking about judging in Christ's earthly ministry. Then we come to the dispensation of grace. And now we're under a period of grace where God is dispensing grace and is showing us his mercy and his love, right? So surely we should not have the death penalty in the dispensation of grace. And we should exhibit mercy and love, right? Well, we'll see. And then we'll end up with the earthly kingdom. 
when Christ comes and sets up his kingdom. So I'm not just going to give you a couple of verses from the Bible and try to say that, here, because of these verses, we're going to take these as proof texts and say that it applies all the way across the board. No, what I want to show you is from a dispensational perspective, the Bible, God, has a lot to say about the death penalty. And by the way, there's a very important reason for it. So we may not get to the reasons, all of the reasons this week. We may just lay the foundation. So then, please come back for the next time when we see the importance of the reason for it. All right. Pre-flood. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter number 4. I want you to see that before the flood, the death penalty was prohibited. And we saw that, we covered it very briefly in Sunday school this morning. Genesis chapter 4, verse number 15 says, well, let's go back to, uh, go back to verse 13. Genesis 4, 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And I pointed out in Sunday school this morning how this clause just reeks to me of Cain being a complete coward. Because he murders somebody and he doesn't have the integrity to take the punishment for his actions. He doesn't want the accountability. And you'll find that that's true with most of the criminals in every single society throughout history, right? Criminals are cowards. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from my face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. Oh, woe is me. I killed somebody, and now you've punished me more than I can bear, because now somebody's going to kill me. So he's complaining about it, but look what the Lord says. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold, and the Lord shall set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So there was no death penalty on the earth uh, after Cain murdered Abel. And Genesis 6.12 shows that all of the ways were co corrupt before the flood. We, we, we looked at that first, right? The way, well, um, let's look at it quickly. Just flip over a page there to Genesis 6.12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now, do you think that there might be a possible correlation between the fact that there's no death penalty, no punishment for that action, and all flesh had corrupted their ways? I submit that for you to let that simmer on the back of your mind as we go through here and see if there's a possible correlation there that might prove to be true. But now I want you to look at something interesting. Go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 5. Now this is context, Genesis 9. Noah steps off the boat, all right? God had just wiped out the flesh off the face of the earth, except for Noah and his family. Noah now is stepping off of the boat, and God's going to tell him a few things. Now we covered in Sunday school this morning the interesting parallel between the first three commands in the Bible that we see and the first three commands given to Noah when he walks off the boat. Here's the third one, though. He walks off the boat, and God says this, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood... By man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So if you picture this, here's what I find interesting. Noah steps off the boat. The ground's not even dry. Noah's probably still seasick. And one of the first things that God does is institute the death penalty. Think about that. Out of all the things he could have instructed Noah, the first thing he told him was to replenish the earth, just as God had commanded in the beginning. The second thing he tells him is that every living thing shall be as meat for you. You can eat it. The third thing, what about love your neighbor, be merciful to all? What, what, what about this? God says, death penalty. 
You take another man's life, your life shall be taken. So what I, isn't it interesting that it's enacted right there as soon as he steps off the boat. God delegated that authority to men. The death penalty was commanded. He didn't give it as a, he didn't insinuate that it's a possibility that you could use it, you know, if you want to. You know, if the crime is especially heinous, you know, maybe you want to use it. No, it, that wasn't the case. It wasn't an option. God commanded it. And he says, some people think that the God of the Old Testament was the mean God, right? And under the law, God implemented all of these things that were very mean and very hard to uphold. But I want you to notice that when did he enact the death penalty? Was the law given before Noah or after Noah? The law was given after Noah. He enacted the death penalty before the law. So what you're going to see, and I can't help but give away some of the future points in order to make points now, right? But what you're going to see is that the people who argue that the death penalty is only applicable under the law in the Bible, you'll see that's not so. Because it was enacted before the law and was not abolished by the law. Okay? All right. Turn to uh, Leviticus chapter number 24. Because what we're going to spend a, um, a little bit of time going through is I want you to see the things in the Bible that God deemed worthy of the death penalty. What are, when we talk about capital punishment, what are the capital crimes? Is it only murder? Well, let's see. Leviticus chapter number 24. Look at verse number 17. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. There's the law confirming what God told Noah in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, that any man who kills another man shall surely be put to death. Now turn back to Leviticus chapter number 20. Leviticus chapter number 20 and verse number 10. Is it only murder? And the man that committeth adultery with... A, Leviticus 20.10, I told you that, right? Verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The Pharisees brought a woman before Christ. Remember that? Christ was teaching... They brought this, the woman before her, and uh, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Like uh, There's this song that I like, and it paraphrases it a little bit. But they bring the woman before Christ, and they say, Lord, what shall we do with her? We know, we know what Moses said. We're not dumb. But what do you say we should do with her? Ah, they knew what the law said, that a woman called, caught in adultery should be put to death. You want to know where that passage comes from? How they knew what Moses said? Well, here it is. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. The adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The death penalty. Look at Leviticus. We're in chapter 20. Look at verse number 13. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, if a man lieth with a man, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So for the act of homosexuality, the death penalty is the proper uh, punishment. I don't think that that's very ambiguous, is it? The culture today says, you know, they, they create gay pride Bibles and, and things like that. And they say, well, the Bible doesn't specifically forbid that. I don't think that there's much ambiguity in the scripture where you have stone and fire raining down upon a city. And you have this specifically stated in the book of Leviticus. But that's not the topic of our conversation. Verse number 15. You know, society denigrates, right? First, it, first, you notice, watch the pattern with which Leviticus goes. First, it talks about adultery. 
Then it talks about homosexuality. You know what's coming next in our society? Well, let's just look at Leviticus because it will tell us. Verse number 15. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. Bestiality. The denigration of man. Scripture knows it all too well. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. God knows. How about, uh, how about we turn to the book of Numbers? Let's look at uh, Numbers chapter 15. Now, there are certain moral laws and there are certain symbolic laws. And we will talk about the difference in the two, not this week, but next week or the week after. But I want you to first see the death penalty was not just for murderers. Numbers chapter 15, look at verse number 33. Well, that's uh, 32. Verse number 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they, they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in a ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. There is prison mentioned in the Bible. But I'll submit to you that prison was never to be used as a punishment in the Bible. Never. They put him in a ward to hold him until they found out what they should do with him. But locking a person up in a cell was not um, a form of punishment in the Bible. So they held him in a ward because God instituted the Sabbath. And he told them, you, shouldn't vi you shall not violate my Sabbath. It's an everlasting covenant between me and my people. They find a man violating the Sabbath. What should we do with him? So they brought him to Moses in the congregation. They, put him in, uh, they held him in a cell until they figured out. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 35, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. So the penalty for violating the Sabbath was death. And I, I don't really don't want to get into it right now, but just to make this simple point, I come out of a background where we were told that we had to keep the Sabbath, all right? And that it was a good thing to do it. And you shouldn't work on the Sabbath because that's bad. And, um, you know, there were some people who needed to do some work in the church. And the only day that this guy had off was Sunday. So he said, I'll come in and I'll fix this on a Sunday. And the pastor said, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it on Sunday. We don't, we don't work on Sundays. What's, what's interesting here is, what is the penalty for breaking the Sabbath? What's the penalty? Death. It's not one of these things where, if God told you to do it, how about you be consistent and keep it? If you're really, if you're really consistent in, you, in your beliefs, and you think that breaking the Sabbath is wrong because you're confused and you think that we're Israel, and as a church, you're going to put people under the law. And if that's what you believe, then why, oh why, will you take this part, but not that part? You'll go back and you'll take the part that says, the Sabbath is for me and my people, you shall keep it holy. Oh, that sounds good, I'll keep that part. Yeah, let's keep that, that's good. The part about breaking it, I never heard one of them institute a penalty or a punishment for breaking it. Because if, you know, I live my life based upon the truth. And I, I, live, I live out what I believe. If I believe it to be true, that's the way I'm going to live my life, right? If it says that you're to put somebody to death, why not uphold that standard? Why not be consistent in your belief? And if you're not going to do it, then can you just answer me why you will pick one part, but you won't take the other part under the law? You think you're under the law. You put yourself under the law. You put your congregation under the law, but yet you don't even uphold the law. It's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. Having the form of godliness, but not knowing. All right. Look at Exodus chapter number 21. Exodus 
Exodus chapter 21. I, I, get, I, get, uh, I get frustrated about that because it's impacted my life. You know, I, I was put under that. I dealt with that. I had to deal with that. And I was put under that confusion. And I myself was left trying to figure out which way was up. Trying to figure out, you know, the word. Because I, I took it from a starting point of here's somebody that studied some things and they're putting people under the law. So you take the tradition of what you've been given as your starting point and then you start working forward. And then years later you find out, man, that foundation that I built upon, that was worthless. It was rotting garbage. And then you have to start all over again. Unlearn everything that you've learned. And really just base it, understanding it, the right division. Understanding that there's a difference. Approaching it the way that God says to approach it. Exodus chapter 21. <clears throat> and boy, I really wish, I really wish that our country would um, uphold this law. Exodus chapter 21 and verse number 22. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief, what's her fruit? The fruit of the womb. Not the fruit of the loom, the fruit of the womb. The fruit of the womb is the child that's in her womb, and yet no mischief follow. He shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. A Republican-dominated Supreme Court ruled in Roe v. Wade and said that a woman can murder her child in the womb because they said, we don't know when life begins. And the Republican justice who made the uh, opinion on it, he said, oh, if we could only determine when life begins, then we would know how to rule. And yet, for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years now, we still go with the same failed strategy to think that the politicians are the answer, right? Somehow they have wisdom. We don't know when life begins. And yet you see the little child in the womb sucking his thumb, playing with his toes, hiccups rolling over, the heart is beating, and they don't know when life begins. But the scripture says if you take that life in the womb, then the life of man should surely be taken. All right. Say in Exodus chapter 21, look at verse number 16. In the cases of kidnapping, and he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So in the cases of kidnapping, look at a couple of other instances. Look at verse number 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. There, you know, it's the same thing that we saw in Genesis and Leviticus is there in Exodus. Look at verse number 15. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Look at verse number 17. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now there's a whole study there that we could get into about the, really, the child and the father and the mother and the rebellious child. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But there are death for symbolic ordinances and then there are death for the moral commandments that God gave. In Israel, God commanded the death penalty for not only the capital crimes like murder and kidnapping, but also the symbolic ordinances. That, uh, that some of the symbolic ordinances that he put into place. So today we are not to enforce the symbolic ordinances that were for Israel. In Hebrews, it says, with a change in the priesthood of necessity, there is a change in the law. But what you're left to do, if you don't, right, what, if you don't rightly divide, as I was talking about earlier, what are you left to do? How do you determine if something is worthy of the death penalty or not? Because what was symbolic of Israel, you think you are Israel. So you think that you are to uphold those symbolic ordinances. So how are you left to determine which of these ordinances that require the death penalty should be upheld and which ones should not? If you think you are spiritual Israel, what's a symbol? Or what symbol should be upheld? All of them, right? 
So I, I would hope that the covenant theologians who think that they're Israel, I hope that they're consistent in their viewpoint and support death penalty for somebody picking up sticks on the Sabbath or sparking their stove or getting in the car and smoking, uh, uh, sparking their ignition to start their car to come to a Sunday. And, you know, uh, well, Saturday. They think it's Sunday. I, I don't... <laughs> Can't we just live without the law? God can point out that he gave the opportunity to live without the law and it didn't work. Right? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. I'm pointing this out to say for you today, me, if I had this objection to God and I said, you put this law upon the earth and it's so hard. Peter says, how could we, you know, this yoke which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. The law is a yoke. It's hard. No man could do it. That's why it took Christ to come to die for our sins. So you could, you could have the objection, can't we just live without the law? But God already showed you what happened when he tried to let you live without the law and without the justice that's required of the law. He let you see that before Genesis. And what happened? Evil continually. Evil continually. You think things are bad today. Imagine a society with no restraint. You remember what it said? No restraint. Every man just living out the wickedness in his heart. So can't we just live without the law? No, we can't. God, God already gave us the opportunity and we saw that it didn't work. So during the dispensation of conscious, all those men did what was right in their own eyes and God could point back to that, show that it does, does, didn't work for us. And it's uh, hard for us today, a people who live in a nation and in a world with laws, to try and think back to a time when there was no law. Can you imagine living in a time when there was no law, no police officers, nothing? Many of them did evil because they didn't follow their own conscience as far as what they knew to be right because there was no law. You know, it talks about the hardening of a man's heart, the hardening of a conscience. Think about the contrast there with the people living with no law, no enforcement, the anarchy. So it was every man doing what was right. No enforcement, no punishment, no law enforcement. So for all of eternity, God has laid a foundation in history to show you and to teach the wisdom of his way. So that... In eternity future, there can never be a person that comes before God and objects and says, your law is unjust, no man can do it. You should have tried to give us the ability to do it without the law. Then we would have showed you, God. Boy, we would have really, we would have really done well if you would have only given us the ability. God gave them the slack and they took the noose and they wrapped it around their neck. Pun intended. God gave men the opportunity. Men showed it's a hard issue. And they couldn't live up to that standard. So, what about uh, Christ's earthly ministry? Let's, let's cover this and then we'll stop for today. But let's look at Christ's earthly ministry. Look at uh, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. You know, there were two thieves hung on a cross with Christ. Do you recall what they said about being executed? About receiving the death penalty? Do you remember what the two thieves said? Luke 23, verse number 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. The criminals who were, who, who were being crucified with Christ, one of them was mocking him, and the other says we are punished justly. If the death penalty is inherently unjust and immoral, 
God wasn't required to record that and put that in Scripture, right? We know that there's some people who say things that are wrong in Scripture, right? Like the Scripture records Satan saying some things. But I tend, this man says that, dost thou not fear God? He's a man who fears God. He knows the justice, the just requirement of God. And he says, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. He knew that it was just for their penalty to be executed. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter number 15. Uh, let's start in verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Okay, so just a reminder, we're now in Christ's earthly ministry, which some people think is the New Testament, and as soon as Christ was born, now we're all under grace, and it's nothing but grace and mercy, and this is what we should administer, right? So Christ's earthly ministry, boy, this is the stuff, because these people, they don't, they don't put Paul's you know, epistles on the same level as Christ. What did Christ say? Because, boy, that's the real meat of the scripture, right? Because... All scripture is not, you know, equally valid in their eyes. But anyways, so they elevate what Christ says, right? But anyways, so he says, For God commanded, Honor thy father and mother, and he, he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. Well, what is that death? Well, we already covered it. But go, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, because I can't let you get away without seeing Christ supporting in his earthly ministry what, he, what was already established under the law. Deuteronomy chapter number 21, verse number 18. If a man have a stubborn... I'll give you an extra second to get there. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse number 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him unto the elders of the city, and unto the gate of the place. And they shall say unto the elders of, this, of his city, this, Our son is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put a w evil away from among you. Ah, well, there's an interesting concept that perhaps we might pick up on next week. That if you do execute the justice of God, you put evil away among the people. Let me cover also, so Christ said in Matthew that, you know, why do you transgress? What, what, what Moses said back here, and here you see that about, um, you know, a rebellious son, and here you see that they should be put to death, all right? That he die the death, as Christ say. Here it is. Well, some say, you mean to tell me that God is so unjust that he would kill a child for being rebellious? Well, you know, some people should, they're so quick to want to criticize God that they don't even take the time to read the verses. Because what did it say in verse number 20? He is a glutton and a drunkard. How many six-year-olds do you know that just sit around drinking all the time and get drunk? So this is talking about, you know, an adult son, someone who's a glutton and a drunkard, a rebellious child that should be punished. All right, so we're not talking about a toddler. We're not talking about any of those types of things. So they're to be put to death. Some think that... Uh, once Christ died on the cross, then all of those Old Testament principles were done away with. 
But Matthew 28, 20, after Christ was resurrected, Christ tells them to go into all nations and do everything I have commanded you. So there, there are the principles there remaining constant, right? Do everything I commanded you. Whatsoever Moses commanded you, there, go, go and do. Remember that? So, anyways, there's the sense here that some people think that the New Testament God had a change of heart, right? He changed his disposition, and from the Old Testament to the New Testament, he became nice. And now he's, you know, just extending mercy and grace to everyone, and just go and live however you want, it doesn't matter. And oh, all those mean things I said in the Old Testament, you know, don't worry about them anymore. Well, that's not true. And the point that I want to make next time when we talk about the death penalty and we finish it is I want to show you that it wasn't mean to uphold the death penalty and to have justice for actions of men. It's the loving thing to do to uphold justice because justice is a dissuasion to those who would likewise murder. So if you love your neighbor, you will uphold the justice of God and enact the death penalty. Because in so doing, you save innocent lives and you save the lives of would-be murderers. Not only that, but we'll also see that when the justice of God is executed, it points men to God because they know that he exists. And without justice, when anarchy reigns, men are lost and they see that there is no, they think that there is no God. But when the justice of God reigns upon the earth, then men know that there is a God of justice and it points them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I hope you come back next week or the week after whenever we finish and you'll see the important points and the reasons behind the death penalty that God has enacted. Let's, let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for the many blessings of this life, Lord. And we're thankful for your word that we have to be able to come together as a lo local group of believers and to study it and to learn from it and to grow, Lord, to spiritually mature and uh, to grow as believers to help uh, not only those that are friends that we're close with here in this assembly, but also to be a light unto the world. Ultimately, Lord, to point people to you so that they see their need of a Savior and they know that your justice is coming. The wrath will be poured out one day. And, uh, Lord, we know it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Help them all to see that. Help us to help them see it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Brandon, for a challenging message from God's Word, Rightly Divided. Uh, if you all want to stand, and we'll sing our closing hymn, Jesus Paid It All. Jesus paid it all. Thank you and you are dismissed.